she's a writer and a storyteller and a naturalista. Hi. <laughs> um, so I have the pleasure of welcoming Miss Adriana Pito to the stage. If you turn to page eight of the booklet, you there is a um, page eight of our booklet. Uh, Adriana Vito, Kaiser Continuous Improvement Engineer and Intersectional Activist for Justice and Peace, founder of Honesty and author of From Personal and Multicultural, uh, From Personal Reflections. Originally from Cameroon, born in France and brought up in Paris, popular and multicultural suburbs, I have always wanted to scientifically prove that human diversity under all its shapes is trend. That is why I rushed into climbing the social ladder and became an engineer, expatriate in Cameroon at the age of 24. But beside, but despite three years working in big companies between Europe, Middle East and Africa, along with my apparent social success, I had to face a depression that led me to leave for Australia in 2015 and become an entrepreneur for true social justice for all. Convinced that our specific experiences as women and young girls from the diaspora, living and growing in environments that don't always nurture our empowerment, we have built stronger resilience worth inspiring the whole African diaspora and even beyond. This is why I have created Honesty and released from personal reflection in 2016 in Melbourne in order to share my story while making coaching and development programs through reflection, aiming at celebrating different forms of success as a way to freedom for all. The program related aims at gathering committed people, professional or not, young and old, to reclaim our natural problem-solving skills, to create new solutions to our own daily and long-term personal and collective issues. As each and every one of us deserves simple and accessible tools for mental, material, and economic empowerment for us by us. The reason why we brought her all the way from France to talk about her own journey our own experiences and to engage our young audience here, but also other members of this audience, especially as a child who was born in diaspora to diaspora parents, something that I think many in this room as parents or as children are going to relate to. Put our hands together. acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and pay my respect to their ancestors, uh, past uh, and present. Um, I was really happy and humbled to have uh, Auntie Caroline yesterday uh, to welcome us to the country and tell us more about uh, the story. I think it's very important. I'm really grateful to be here at the inaugural African Diaspora Women Summit, um, celebrating African women, uh, their voices actually our voices. So through this presentation, I'm going to try uh, to do this with honesty. So voices. Talking about voices, I would like to start with a small experience with you that was made by Kimberly Crenshaw. She's an Afro-American scholar um, who recently made a TED talk. Um, so what I'm going to ask is those of you who are able, please, can you stand up? Like, there's everybody here. Okay, I don't know if it's going to work, so <laughs> I hope you're ready. I'm going to name some names. And uh, when you don't recognize the name, or if there is nothing you can say, or you've never heard about this name, uh, just please sit down. 
and just remain seated. And be careful because the last one remaining standing up, there will be questions. So make sure <laughs> make sure you do it honestly. <laughs> okay. Okay, here are the names. Eric Garner. Mike Brown. Tamir Rice. Brady Gray. Okay, so we already have, wow, almost the entire audience already seated. Wow, okay. Okay, let's keep on going. Um, Michelle Cusseau. Um, Tanisha Anderson. Aura Rosa. Rosa? Okay, I'm not sorry. Okay, Megan Hockaday. Oh my god, four people, it worked actually. <laughs> four people remaining. So you've, have, you've ever heard of all these names? I mean, I'm not too surprised. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Four people remaining. How many are we? Oh, five. Sorry. Oh, seven. 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 Okay, still, it's like less than 10% of the audience. Okay? Thank you very much. So, you're not, yeah, you're not very special. <laughs> Um, so, for those of you um, who probably don't know, all like all these names were names of Afro-American who were killed by the police in the USA in the past two, three years. And what is really interesting about this experience is to realize how the first half of this list is pretty much well recognized. I mean, half of you seem to know about them but the other half is barely known. And the only difference between the two half, of, like these two people, is that the second list was about Afro-American women. And that's um, what Kimberly Crenshaw used to introduce uh, uh, the concept that she called intersectionality. Uh, so intersectionality is a concept really close to my heart. Uh, because I think it actually concerns ev every one in of us here. So intersectionality is overlapping or intersecting social identities, as well as uh, the related systems of oppression, domination, or discrimination that goes with these identities. So I don't think it's really easy to understand the definition, to be honest. Uh, personally, I was introduced to this term by Nilmini Fernando, who is a scholar here in Melbourne. And <laughs> and um, the reason why it's so close to my heart is because me, Adriana Vito, like I think others here actually, I am a black woman. Actually, I'm a young black woman, um, and I was born from a low-income single-parent class, and I'm also honest, that is to say, I'm not always politically correct. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in 2014, um, as Mimi read in my bio, I was actually working as an engineer in Cameroon, uh, where I never lived before. And um, I was very successful and had much money than I ever had in my life. Uh, but I had to see a psychotherapist and it helped me work on my identity. And that's when I actually realized that I was all of these things. And the interesting thing for me is that climbing the social ladder, which is an economical and material ladder, definitely didn't feel like climbing the happiness ladder, which is usually seen as a utopian, even taboo ladder. And that's how I came to decide that I will probably define my own ladder that I can call the H ladder, like honesty. And that is why in 2015, I accepted to leave one of my first big dream um, come true coming to Australia so as I could just take time to think about how I can use my engineering skills 
to actually solve the problems that are really close to my heart. And talking about heart, and being in Australia, I also learned a lot about the history of Australia that Auntie Caroline reminded uh, us yesterday, uh, and this colonial situation that we also know in Africa, really it's different. Um, and it really helped my definition of my own identity and myself. That is why a year after that, I decided to release from personal reflection here uh, in Australia, which is um, a book that aimed at sharing this experience and complete the step of honesty that I call community. When you found your people and you can share your experience so as you extend those tools to other people. And that is also when I had, once again, the support of our dearest Dr. Mimi, and it was really important for me to have her, because as we've been speaking a lot in this um, summit, intergenerational, intergenerational uh, conflict, relations, um, made me uh, having this conflict with my mom. So I had to leave this big day. It was on my birthday, actually. I released the book uh, as a gift to myself as well, and has to be both as a gift to people who came, and Mimi being here, you were really like a mother to me, and it really touched me a lot, so. <laughs> Thank you very much, once again. Okay, so I'm just gonna tell you a bit more about Honesty. So Honesty was born uh, after I realized how much I love all the differences that exist within our humanity. And I really wonder what we can do to actually preserve those differences and not try to erase them. And that's why I created Honesty with a big H, a bit like how, how do we do it? We've heard a lot of very good advice just before. Don't let people define who you are, talk to a friend. Uh, we, we come from a land of kings, we have to embody all those things. How do we do it? What are the steps like? I was thinking, uh, I think at some point somebody said, oh, if you feel depressed and you can't leave your bed, call a friend or somebody you trust. When you're depressed, you don't know who you trust. That's the, the thing, you, you, nothing is clear on your, on your mind. So I've been creating honesty, really sharing all the tools that I'm using now, like really step by step, so as you actually can find these answers in the time where it's really hard to find any answers. So I like to describe honesty like a journey from honesty to peace. And in terms of organization, it's about applying our excellence. We, we talked about excellence a lot here, and I was talking about excellence a lot in my work as well, and we usually, we usually apply it to industrial excellence or economical excellence, and I'm like, why don't we have the same kind of standard for social justice performance? So that's what honesty is trying to do on a daily basis. So when I say journey, I'm really talking about the step-by-step -step development programs that honesty offers that are inspired by my life over 17 countries, but also your lives too. And I hope that with time it's gonna be alimented more and more um, when I say honesty, what I actually mean is Kaizen reflection and action thanks to self-questioning. Kaizen is actually a Japanese methodology and philosophy that I was taught at school uh, in order to improve production in industries. But when you really look at it, you realize that Kai means um, improvement and Zen means well-being. You don't use it in English, but in French we say I am Zen. Like, I'm feeling really good. And somehow uh, they translated it into continuous improvement, but I think it's really about improving your well being and taking this journey of being honest with yourself and having action that matches your words. And all of this with the objective of reaching peace. What I mean by peace is optimization of each and every one of us' well being. I really believe and I'm truly convinced that our collective freedom is tightly attached to the freedom of each and every one of us.
So that's exactly why I decided to start my personal reflection so as I could actually have a look at all the challenges that I overcame and really take the time to observe myself so as I could know how to improve it. Um, so this little piece of me that I share is on a book that you'll be able to find on Amazon or on H website. So if I can tell you a bit about this journey, in 2015, I was completing the step acceptance, which led me to actually tell my crazy idea to Gary Pauly, who is an Aboriginal activist. And this conversation actually triggered the writing of the book for me. So that was a really good thing. In 2016, I was completing uh, the step community and actually um, reconciled with my mom when I went back to Paris during summer time there. And I could really embody Honesty's motto, which is a dream is never too big or too crazy to be achieved. We've been talking about visions and having a plan, but I like to use the word dream because I feel like it helps us having these really big ideas and really honest idea about who we want to be and not necessarily fit in the boxes that says that success is about school or success look like this or like that because we're really diverse and it's this diversity that actually allows us to thrive. What I keep saying is I'm somebody who loves thinking whole day, every day, personal reflection, collective reflection, yeah. But imagine we were all thinking all day, every day like me. We would never eat. Like no room would be tidy or anything. That would be a disaster. We really need that diversity in the way we are successful. And this year in 2017, I've been completing the step called communication when I came back to France and succeeded in gathering my French people around this initiative that is um, growing every day. So all this obviously with the aim to reach a collective reflection. Of course it's important to think about ourselves and I think it's really important to retreat individually and think about who we are and what we want, but obviously that's with the aim of building something collective because if I could learn something by being a successful engineer in Cameroon is that I was successful, I had money, but I was so lonely and it didn't make any kind of sense. I think, um, uh, I forgot his name, but somebody talked about not being willing to live anymore. I was not willing to live anymore. And I was supposedly with my family, I had a job, I had a partner in life, I had this beautiful picture of the life that we're all trying to reach, and I just didn't have any good reason to be alive because I was alone and I was trying to do it by myself all the time because this is what we're taught. I think especially as African women, we really have this thing, especially when we're skilled and we can know that we're powerful and we can do a lot, we just want to do it all on our own, which doesn't make any kind of sense, but that's what we do. <laughs> and it's like too heavy, and it doesn't make sense, and nobody's happy. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Who ever felt that? Like seriously. And nobody's happy because you're helping and people are not, it's not enough for people and you're frustrated because you're like, I've done, I've given you my all and still you're not happy. Like nobody's happy, it's just the worst equation ever. <laughs> just mathematically it's not good. No. <laughs> so the idea of the collective uh, reflection is really that age is a continuously looking for partnerships with reflective women, men and organizations who want to make an honest change, starting by changing and leading, leading themselves first. So I'm not going to speak more than this because I really want to share with you and celebrate our voices through Q&A, but thank you very much and in the unlikely event that you wouldn't have any question, I actually have a question for you, which is, what is your honest voice? What is your dream? Thank you. Any yeah, questions? Or right, answers? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I really like what you said about um, 
African women wanting to do everything by themselves, but something that we were quietly and rudely discussing when we were speaking was that a lot of times people won't allow you to delegate something to them if they don't get something out of it. So if there's no immediate gratification to them for helping you, then they don't, or they won't, or they do it haphazardly, and it's a poor reflection of you. So sometimes it's a, it's a mechanism to ensure that the quality or the standard or the excellence of something is at where we want it if we do it ourselves. Yeah. Do you have a response for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can really relate to that. And I think the, the reason I also um, created this is because, yeah, I really believe we are in a system that makes us like make those decisions. Like, I mean, I was exactly the same. You like, I'd rather just do it by myself because otherwise it's gonna be even more work for me because either I will have to follow up or I won't be happy. And as you said, and people are so used to have us doing everything anyway that they wouldn't even do it. That's also why I really think that it's about being honest about what we're trying to achieve. And also when we're, when we're actually asking somebody to do something for us, it's like a business conversation. I mean, it's a negotiation. And unfortunately, I think we live in a world where honesty is really not nurtured, like we can't. Because you need, like, according to me, what I do today is I'm really honest about what I want to reach and also why. And I really want the person to be like, do you want to do it and why and what do you expect at the end of it? Because for example, I made this survey, as I'm setting honesty as a social enterprise, and asked people what is the biggest taboo of today. I mean, that was in France, but I think that applies. And I think the number two was like money. And that's the thing. Also because we don't speak about money, then it stays as a background, I don't know what, or, no, that's the thing. <laughs> no, we just don't say stuff. In French, we say non dit, like non said. You don't say stuff, and then afterward, 10 years after, yeah, but this, da, 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 and you're like, oh, we never discuss that. Yeah. Because I think what we don't see about communication is that words are 10%, sounds are 10% of the communication. There is an entire body language that we need to take into account in order to understand one another. And I think if we don't do that work, first of all, on ourselves to know what we want, what we're ready, what we're ready uh, to give to get it. Um, and then expect this from people as well, showing them how to do it by example, because it's really not natural anymore in our society. I think we'll always be in that kind of situation.
even I'm driving my own house. And then I say to my kids, you need to share, and then no one will be angry. Because if I walk everything by myself, I will never be happy. Yeah. I will never be happy. Then for me, it's not only to ask you a question. As a young girl, a young woman, and you are building up a social enterprise, which is not an easy task to do, and you have to face a lot of discouragement. Thank you, you're already there, I hope so. But I want to ask you a question. Do you think, as a black woman, proud of who she is first, do you think that African young women are capable to take it, to embrace, to move on, or to try to change the, that cultural issue that is depending on everyone. That's my point. Because every job in this world, people think that you have to be as you say, all those mm, degrees, what you want. I always say to people, the mainstream situation, when I was growing up in Cameroon, because I'm Cameroonian, mm. like in Cameroon, I did all my study in French. Then, when I was growing up, we have the mainstream. The other kids who didn't succeed was lost was bullshit. Then they don't really empower that you can be a builder, you can be a planter, you can be a plumber, and this is good. You can be a mechanic, this is good. This can give you your financial freedom. Then that's one of my dreams, I'll share that with you. Then I want to need for you to make sure that as you are growing, as you are building this social enterprise, to make people to know that be an engineer, it's not always happiness. Yeah, that's really, yeah. And yes, yes, <laughs> if I think that young black women are able, of course, of course we are. I'm, I'm sure of this, and I think it's really about having people who actually believe in you. Yeah. I used not to understand that sentence. I was like, what does a belief will do to me, or I don't know. But it does make a huge difference, and that's also why I'm doing this, to, to be this person for the people who don't have one, because I felt for a long time that I didn't have anybody believing in the real me. I needed to be an engineer to be loved, which didn't work. <laughs> so, obviously. <laughs> so, yes, yes, of course we can, but we definitely need to build solidarity. We need to build solidarity among ourselves and create our own system of values as well, because the mainstream will not become something else. I think we can and we will and we are actually, I think we are actually creating these spaces that are different and where we can be successful and economically empowered, mentally and everything, yes. Can I just add one? Yes. Okay. Sorry, we have to leave. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Sorry, I think more than I Thank you so much for the reservation speech. For those that don't know me, my name's Abraham Schwartz, and I'm known by Abe for short. And I've done a lot of work in the social justice space. And when I learned that Mimi was Bree Adriana here to Melbourne, and, um, and I looked on the website and I'd understood all about the the work that you've done, which linked to Indigenous, like you talked about Gary Foley, linked back to trips to Australia. I was very, very excited. I interviewed Dr. Mimi on a radio show, which went all around the world and in Jewish Radio FM in Melbourne about this conference. And when I went on the website to learn more in preparation for interviewing Mimi, I learned about Adriana. And I was very, very excited that somebody with this sort of point of view that was trying to find a way to bring the honesty to the social justice arena as well was one of your opening points. And I had a chance to make her the, the, <laughs> the day before the conference. We've recorded an interview with her, we've recorded another one here today. And between that, I'm going to make a podcast of what she's just done. But I just wanted to bring the conference organizers. I was pleased to give you that. Uh, welcome to the podium, Dr. Burhan Ahmed. I'm not sure where to start, but she started with self-reflection. So let me start with my self-reflection, where, where I am and where I come from. To be honest, I've been, I've been doing advocacy for the last 
25, 30 years on refugee and the Italian education. Then I was, you know, at London University for over 17 years. And I, I always see the decision makers, the people dreaming the top, graduating and going. And none of my background coming through that and passing. So how long are we going to wait to come to hit the roof where we can stand, our generation to come and to leadership? It's time to call. In fact, the last call that awaited me was when Joe Hockey in 2014 said the age of entitlement is over. Which means for our community, deep inside means a lot where we don't have the skills, the education in majority speak. And that's the challenge where I said that it's time to leave out and take a sabbatical leave and challenge myself to do some practical work rather than addressing politicians or the media and just go on talking. So the issue I've taken now is sitting among the businesses in the communities in food scry are learning so much in how the community is struggling to meet the end. And one of the area of my now over you know many years that focusing on news, not only news as in what's the media, but news as in the stories of us telling it to others. So I started publications interviewing women young people and businesses. And one of the challenges I saw was uh, right. one of the challenges I saw was women, refugee women entrepreneurial skills. Without doubt in Africa, our women was handling the challenge of daily life plus they have business skills. Translating that into this 21st economy was the biggest challenge. And I live on it on an everyday basis where I see people are trying to meet the aim instead of waiting for welfare. Because that's the addiction that most of these women want to get and move into the other side of the equation and stand on their own feet. So, what I want to put here is why they're looking for entrepreneurial skills, which they already have, is because the job market, Australia of 20th century, was a manufacturing economy where they don't need your head, your brain, your thinking, they just need your body. Australia 21st century, they need your brain, you can sit at home and do anything to, to, to get salary. So a century where we are now, for most of our women, especially from a refugee background, it's a quite challenging to fit into the system. So despite the challenges, despite the problems, running from war and running from the continent, the desire of entrepreneurial skills was not given. And this is a witness that you can come to Footscray and you can see how many of these women, you can go to Dandina, you can see how many of these women are standing on their feet. They're not making profit, but they're sustaining their life to stand on their feet. And this is where we need to see where the challenges are. To be honest with you, I can live in the rocket science. But the most people that need my help and need the people that we need to bring, because as Africans, one person making a mistake, we are all insulted. Mm -hmm. We cannot afford to keep getting one person wrong. Let alone, as a community, if we make a mistake, that would be a war. Imagine one young boy makes a mistake, and you can see that, and I have been witnessing myself, the, King, the, the, the nightclub at King's Cross, here in, in Sydney and in Melbourne. Always there is fighting. But the color is not black. So that doesn't, doesn't attract the media. One boy from us, or one boy of us, a dark skin brings the whole world into a question. 
So for us, the challenge is double compared to the others. So when I look to that, so the regulatory systems are not helping us in standing this. So the, the question for me is the informal entrepreneurial stuff is moving on now with our women. I mean by informal because the bureaucracy and to get a license in Australia in 21st century, it's a nightmare. Let alone for a woman with no educational background, a woman with a degree <coughs> to have a license on something, it's not easy. You need so many consultants, so many paperwork, so many advices to, meet, to move one step. So the informal market is now an open way of dealing with this. So what are the barriers in this formality to, to deal with? Besides the formal, Yes. Now, besides the formal and institutional nightmare, including the cultural norms, still impact negatively on the women who want their entrepreneurial skills to get away from the unemployment market. To be unemployed and to be in something in Central Lake is the worst. So to get over that, the banks, to be honest with you, in 2013, 12, with Lindsay Tanner, the ex-treasurer, we approached the banks to try to provide our communities with some financial support. And the nightmare for that staff was each and every one, most of our women and men at the same time, they do business and then they go for law. Here you need to do a business plan and then approach the bank, whatever cash you got, then go through it and do it. In most of our traditional ways, People start their business and they move to the next step. So that is by itself now one of the challenges. <coughs> Lack of support. If you read my last publication, a woman with nine children, she has a business. Despite the nine children, she's surviving and doing the business. So how much support does she need to maintain the nine children at home and to maintain the business. And in fact, to be honest with you, I was blown out to see her to actually have two shops, one in Sunshine and one in Putzkrat. Not one, but two. In a normal way, that is something beyond anyone's reach. But what I'm trying to show you here is the resilience that this woman had, and most of our women have that resilience. Despite all that load, of family, they can, and to be honest with you, as a man, if I, if, and, and you've seen that uh, on the Facebook or whatever, the man, he has got what? Boxes. While the woman, he has got wires. It's all interlinked. Okay? She can talk here, she can listen this way, and she can. And that's a fact. To be honest with you, you know, uh, when I sit with, with my wife, with any woman, I wonder if I can just like a meeting, I need to take a deal. But no, she can listen to me and she can listen to others and she can talk. So that is not, is not in me or in, in any man that I have lived with. So the challenge, refugee woman, the informal sector is offering economic activity or economic participation that provide <coughs> adequate and secure alternative of being unemployed. It also offers opportunity for informal money making. As you know, our previous treasurer, previous previous, said there will not be any informal in our economies. And this is part of the challenge that I see. How are we going to live in 21st century Australia? Peter Costello. Time of GST said Australian economy will be all formal. The informal economy or the cash 
will be out and will be in. And this is where we're headed. So we need to think now, in five years, Australia will be where? And how is our community to face this? Yes, we are talking about our youth. It's a symptom, the youth, youth in any society is a symptom of the society. Whatever that society is a reflection by the youth, whatever happens to them, or whatever they are reacting, because it's a reaction of symptoms of the society. So imagine in five years, in 10 years, what will be Australian economy, and what will be these issues that are looking to our, to our women, particularly with business, that we need to create our own employment. Because Australia now has got either knowledge or service economy. There is no money what we already have. It's now out. So it's about skills, it's about talents, it's about degrees, qualifications. So people without that skill, where would they be? So let's look into the issues that some of the way forward that I, I, I tried to jot in. Uh, the challenge we need to look through education and information activity. Even for the educated ones, the challenge is at heart. And I am doing it on a daily basis, trying to do writing, trying to write, trying to communicate, especially the network. If you don't have network, whatever qualification you have, you're out. Right. Okay? The regulatory environment. And you know now, you call an office, say consumer affairs. That one. That three. Press five. Press seven. By the time you get to the person, you've gone over and over and over. So imagine for someone with little language. Imagine for a woman with little and five, six kids roaming around her. It would be a nightmare. So the solutions are to be looking into this challenge. Is we need to look, as in the last, uh, the, the, the one before, the last one, we need to look how to bring laws and systems that the video, the record systems <coughs> translated into languages that these people can get benefit of. I tell you, I can, you know, how many of these women are there in the business? And to be honest with you, sometimes they can make a 10 years journey and they can lose it in a fraction of a second. And I have seen it and I can see it. So how far can we go and all that stuff loses in a fraction of a second because the system has no concessions. It says you're wrong, you're wrong. You're right, you're right. There's no if or back when it gets to the decision making. Some, they come with fines. To be honest with you, some of the fines that I see in my office is mind blowing. 13,000, 27,000, 15,000 traffic fines, maybe license fines. Because if you don't pay on the day, the due date, and most people are not into that sort of mood. So what I'm trying to say is, how do we bring this into our communities? How do we bring this, when Australia now talking about, in fact now, the liberals, despite their argument of migrants who are blessed to be with us, they're talking about increasing refugee intake from 13,500 to about 18,000. Which means Victoria, as in Victoria law, we take about 25 to 30 percent of refugees coming to Australia, which brings in the current climate we get three to five, three to four thousand refugees. And in this, women and children will be about 60 to 70 percent, or more than that. So that is a question, and especially for us, as I said, we have, if not double, triple effort to make. Not one of us made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Burhan. Just before you leave the stage, we'd like to present you with a small gift.
to represent the interests of migrant communities in Australia to the federal government. So if you have an issue that is affecting your community, that is the responsibility of the federal government, FECA will take that issue and try and bring about change to legislation or to attitudes and so on. But we need to hear your voices. And what I've been really impressed by throughout this conference is the discussions around leadership and around organization. Because organization and leadership is really important in making sure the voices of migrant African communities are heard at the levels that can bring about change. But what I would also want to say is that your stories, while in some ways, will be very individual and very special, they're also very similar stories to many other migrants in Australia, both now and in the past. And there are a large number of organisations that are already set up to represent the issues that you've been talking about today. So don't feel like you're alone. Make sure you use organisations like the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria. Yeah. Um, work with people like Dr. Me, Dr. Burhan, who are already talking to TCCB, to FECA, to the state government. And don't feel that you always have to start from scratch. Learn from other migrant community organisations that have been through this and done this. And they also felt like they were alone when they first got here. Why is this important? Yeah. Well, some of the changes that are about to happen, and I'm going to be a bit political here, and Becca is not associated with any political party, but some of the changes that are about to happen at the federal level will impact every single person in this room. That is the changes to citizenship. Yes. The government has proposed changes to citizenship that will change the fundamental basis of Australia's multicultural system, of Australia's immigration system. It says that if you want to become a citizen of this country, you need to speak English at level IL-6. That is higher than the level of English required for international students to get into Victorian University. Now, who does that impact? It impacts communities that are not from the UK, that are not from, not, not from Canada, or it's not communities who've migrated from Europe and speak French or Spanish or Greek and who can learn English. It's African communities, it's Asian communities. You are directly affected by this, and this is a really important time to have your voice heard through organisations like that. This legislation also says that you will have to wait four more years as a permanent resident before you can even apply for citizenship. So that means jobs are excluded, that you are at greater risk of <coughs> having your permanent residency taken from you, yeah? It says that the children that we've talked about in this room, who may have had challenges in their youth and fallen on the wrong side of the law, um, but being born in, or being born in this Australia or come here when they're very, very young, will no longer be welcome here. We have to stand up against this. Now, it's very difficult when you're living the life of a migrant to do that. And that's why organisations like FECA are here. It's much easier for people like me, who are not struggling with the daily experience of being a migrant, to represent those views. And often we're talking to people who look like me and trying to convince them. And that's my job in FECA. And if you want to know why I care, why someone like me would care, I'll tell you. Because I grew up in England, my father's Australian, in a really multicultural part of the UK. But a lot of migrants, particularly from uh, northern India, southern Pakistan. 
but from other countries too. And that encouraged me to travel. I didn't even have to study about other cultures because it was happening in my classroom. It gave me tremendous joy and tremendous richness that has benefited me in every job that I've had, be it in the commercial sector, in the academic sector. It gave me the confidence to travel, to learn foreign languages. I speak Korean and Chinese because I became fascinated by some Chinese culture with my Chinese friends. Yeah? Multiculturalism is good, and many people like me, who look like me, believe in it. And that's why we're very keen to represent the interests of people who might not be able to or don't have the time or the voice to speak out. So, once again, I encourage you to organise, to use voices in your community to connect with people like Beckett, people like Ethnic Community Councils, so we can represent your voices. And for all of the challenges in Australia, the organs of democracy do work here. Sometimes quiet, but you can make representations of the politicians. You can appear in front of committees. That's how we beat the changes to 18C. That would have effectively allowed people to say what they wanted about people of colour or different races. And that's what we have to do with this citizenship. Okay. And so I'm very privileged to have been here to hear the stories of many people in this room because it's made me even more passionate. And I know that African women are very strong. I lived in Sierra Leone and worked there during the Ebola outbreak, and I worked in Swaziland um, on HIV and TB, and I've worked with many strong African women, and I saw the strength of African women in bringing change um, to the challenges that they faced in those two countries at the time, and I have no doubt that that strength will benefit and add to Australia, and that is why someone like myself will continue to represent your voices.